All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back with another episode. This is episode 42 of the Mental Sweat Show. You're joined here to get today by none other than our former strength coach, Coach Baggett, now at Nevada. How are you doing, Coach? I'm doing awesome. How are you guys doing today? Doing great, all great right. to have you. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. you guys having me on. It's been, yeah. you know, it's awesome to catch up with not only former teammates, but former coaches as well. And I'd argue to say that like we're the closest with not our position coaches, not the head coach, but with the strength coaches. Cause we spend, you know, most of the year with you guys. We're cause you know, position coaches, head coaches, they're on, they're on the road recruiting. And that's really when we're working out every morning for three plus hours with you guys. And I say that's when we really get like close with you guys. Cause we're spending so much time with you. And I don't think a lot of the fans realize that. Well, and it's really true, too, because those are some of the most intense times, one, where you learn, you know, who's really about it. You, you get to learn, you know, what, what individual is, you know, there just to be part of the team or like this is like what they want to do. And I think, you know, too, that you, it, it becomes comfortable. So it becomes an environment where it's almost like a locker room environment. So you get to see like the real person. It's not, you know, the, the weight room is not really based on playing time. Right. So sometimes, you know it's everybody gets a fair shake if the, if the coach allows it, right. As long as the strength coach is given that, but that's one of my favorite parts of kind of having, you know, it's between the strength staff and the special teams coordinator that coaches the entire team at any part of the year. Right. So we, we coach the entire roster year round and I love that aspect of it. You know, I couldn't imagine coaching, you know, like 15 guys and not knowing half the other team's name, the guys on the team, whatever else. So that's, you know, a really unique perspective we get to have. Yeah, and, and I think another super unique perspective is that you get to see guys at their lowest of lows and at their highest of highs almost year round. You get to see guys when it's 6 a.m. and they're throwing up on the side of the field after yeah. running, and then you get to see guys crush their most weight they've ever moved in their entire life. Um, so super interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, the more you're in it, the more you realize – I mean, I, I think we all started out thinking that like, you know, being a meathead was really cool and like loving coaching weights. But I mean, it's way more about, you know, a, as you see, like you guys have seen, you know, different levels of coaches come through, even being at Oregon and, you know, the style of strength coaches and, and you know, you guys haven't known me and my style as an assistant, uh, not changed very much now leading a program along with Coach Wilson. But, you know, you do have the ability to to have influence over, you know, in a really influential time you're 18 to 22 or whatever 30 now with the with the covid covid <laughs> years that some of these guys are getting but right. but i mean aside from high school when those are really times that you kind of you know form who you are like there college is one of those times too and so it is it's a very vulnerable time too where like you know you can have a bad day coming in and someone is on your head coaches are you know because you're coming in with the wrong attitude or whatever and like that can you know that can set you up for some lows like you're talking about or you know lifting guys up, having, having PRs that guys are proud of in the weight room or just, you know, getting physically in shape that gets you ready to go, you know, compete for a job. But those things are all the aspects that you're trying to sell when it's like, all right, we got to come in and it's like big spot Friday, or we got to go in and, you know, it's eight station, four station. We got to go push these sleds for, you know, what have you. So there's a really unique perspective, just being a strength coach in college football. But there's also like, I take responsibility for that, for, for the influence we can have over the individuals. Yeah. hundred percent. It is awesome. Uh, you're giving me PTSD with naming those drills, though. Um, right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, let's start. You know, we see the Nevada on your chest, the pack helmet in the back. Obviously, head strength coach at Nevada. Pretty sweet. Uh, but you want to talk about your stops along the way. Obviously, we met you at Oregon. But you want to talk about kind of your road to sure. getting the head job at Nevada? Yeah, I mean, it, it's been a long time coming and something that I've been waiting for. But, um, you know, all the way back, I played college ball at Virginia Tech. I played, played under Frank Beamer. Um, and I did a GA there as well. Um, and I left there and I worked for the Olympic Training Center out in Colorado Springs. So didn't work football there, but I took uh, time as I was finishing my master's to go work somewhere else. because I've been at Tech for six years um, and I got my first full-time job at East Carolina University. So I was in North Carolina working for the Pirates uh, for two different coaches. Um, Skip Holtz was there before he left to go to South Florida. And then Coach Ruffin Neal came in there and uh, he brought in a bunch of guys uh, some guys you may know now, like our, our offensive coordinator was Lincoln Riley. And so there's, you know, there was a, uh, <laughs> yeah, he was the, the young, <laughs> youngest, youngest OC in college football and a bunch of that staff there at ECU um, kind of moved on. He went back to Oklahoma. Uh, I left there and I worked for the Marine Corps 
I worked for MARSOC, which is the Marine Corps Special Operations Command, for about four years. So I left college football to go train special operators. Um, and I loved that time uh, training, training special operations. But my heart was really ultimately in football. And I had an opportunity to get back to the University of Illinois, um, where we got let go after about a year and a half. So, um, you know, coaching wheel turns and coach gets fired and everybody else kind of gets let go. And I was at Maryland, um, University of Maryland, for five years, five seasons. Um, and I made the decision to, uh, you know, through networking and everything else that I thought, you know, had opportunity to, when, um, you know, Reed Kagey left to go work, work with the staff that you guys knew at Oregon. And I took the opportunity to go as an assistant uh, to Oregon where ultimately met Coach Wilson. And, you know, now we're here and, uh, you know, long road, a lot of moves, a lot of stops and, and sometimes strategic, sometimes just by virtue of what happens in coaching where, you know, it's not by virtue of the, the job that you do, but just, you know, somebody else screws up or something happens. And, you know, you hear way more of those these days now that, you know, the coach is getting let go. But, you know, hopefully we can, can control our own destiny for a while and get the pack back on uh, back on the right path and get some wins and stick around here for as long as we want to. Yeah, right on. I mean, we could talk the for a whole episode just about your time with, with the Marine Corps. But I guess no doubt to, to probably to our listeners, what they probably want to know is simply, you know, what are kind of the training differences between a special ops guy and your typical division one football player? Well, I'll tell you, it's really funny. And, and like the ground level is what I found out is that people just don't understand the both sides of things. Right. And, and yeah, that could be a full episode or more. And there's some awesome stories that I have, but the more I, the more I got into it, the more the special operations community wanted to train like pro or college level athletes. And now colleges and college coaches want like this military style training. Um, and it's really, the foundations are all the same. Conditioning is really similar. Um, everybody needs a base of strength. And then you look at what the, you know, I came in and I was the first strength coach with a battalion that I was working for. So there, there were 180 special operators and there were another 320 support individuals who were in the Marine Corps or the Navy um, that I was training. So think like an entire athletic department, all the teams, all wow. the administration, like all the coaches, like if you look at it that way, so everybody, so the the teams, the special operators who were deploying and going on like you know crazy missions, they needed to train a certain way. But in the military, you have at least twice a year of physical fitness tests, right? So everybody had some kind of physical component to it, and we were just we were just beginning a human performance program. So I had the unique ability for having been a you know a GA and a, a full time strength coach for about six years at that point, and so it was an opportunity for me to go kind of have my own program and run it. So um, was really cool there. But the, the best part of it was I just made really good relationships with the command who were the higher ups and the teams. And so really I started traveling with the teams and seeing what their training was like, because you can go to football practice or you played football, or you can watch a sport and see what it's like to do that type of sport. But you can't really get you know, boots on the ground. Like, what is it like to go get shot at or like go, you know, so <laughs> I didn't get shot at, but I did go do, do some of the training with the guys where they'd strap me up in all the gear and I, you know, walk through the shoot house behind the team or, you know, do those types of things where you learn wow. what the physical capacity was for, you know, that type of mission. And, and then I was able now to train those guys more specifically for certain types of missions. And there was, you know, a handful of type of missions that I knew that these teams would be going on. And so, just like a football year, you have like your training cycle, right? You have your winter, your spring, you know, your summer, your fall. We had that in an 18 month rotation. So I would knew they would, they would be doing certain things throughout the year and we would train them either for those things or through those like spring ball, right? You're not training this hard. You know, we would do, there's a time where these guys are training super hard. So you can only do minimal physical training. So you just learn that, that schedule and that's kind of how you began to train them. But really the stories were that community is not really different than being on a team in college football, right? You have, there's like some really like crazy people. There's some really freak athletes. There's some guys that are just grinders. Um, there's some dudes that are really smart. Like it's, it's like every man USA, like it's like, just like being in a, a college locker room. So I love that. It was just an older group of guys. It was 26 to 40 years old versus like 18 to 23. You know, so that that was where, you know, the similarities are. There's so m many more similarities and differences like 
you know, anybody that you see that on your college roster, that you're like, that dude's a hard worker or that guy's a grind or whatever. Those guys probably would have made it. Or that guy's got a screw loose. Like those guys probably would have made it, you know, in that, in a hundred percent though. I mean, it's, it's, it's true. That's, that's insane. I mean, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine. Right. Because the team, the team aspect, I mean, obviously football, you take it to a point, right. Where it's like, all right, you're growing together as a team, but end of the day, it's, you know, it's a game. Uh, right. in, in this, in this, in the military, right. It's, it's really life or death, uh, that these guys are essentially training for. Sure. Um, so I guess the stakes are just that much higher. Well, yeah. and I think that's where I have really, in my estimation, not utilized like the go to war or like the battle, like in the game and out of respect for being in that community a little bit, but what it did do for me and, and you guys were really familiar with like, you know, with coach fell with mindset. I was really interested in the way that the the military community grew their leaders, right? Because in the military community, they really uphold and uplift and respect and value leadership qualities. And so, you know, I had worked for a guy at Maryland that was of a lot of the same tree of those guys that had, that had gone to Oregon from like the Alabama tree and like taking some of the same template, right? And the mindset was something that was already on my, my mind before I encountered some of those guys at Maryland and then saw what coach fell did with it. But to me, it was a little bit more of like beginning to, to uplift it and try to grow the leadership of like whatever team I was going to be a part of after with that military. So that's, that's been something that's been on my plate. And, you know, I, I I've kind of carried on some of those mindset traditions with our team, but to me, it's more of utilizing some of those concepts without like, I, I don't really know a lot of 18 to 22 year olds that haven't been in the military that understand like the concept of talking about war or getting shot at or any of those things. So I don't utilize those as like the example. It's more of like, yep. how are you a good teammate? How, how are you when you're receiving, you know, a message from a coach that you don't really like, or they're yelling at you, how do you take that message and, and respond in the right way? And so kind of like be a great teammate, be a great lead yourself first some of those concepts that go way further and you know it clicks for everybody at, at a different time but that's been really big for me taking those type of lessons from the military and seeing how in that really unique community and smaller community with special operations a lot of those guys have to work alone it's like each team is like a position group right it's like 14 to 20 guys um on a team that operates pretty much by themselves so every man has a role and a responsibility to the team and so it's just a unique perspective that not everybody has that I've kind of carried on with me now to be able to tell those stories and to be able to talk about them and utilize that experience to be able to kind of push our team to the next level as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, all right, following up there, kind of a double question here. First of all, how cool is it to run your own weight room, being the head man? Second of all, I know a lot of people just see, you know, just people screaming on the highlight films because they're cool, you know, guys throwing out a lot, a lot of weight. But, like, actually, like, how much work does, like, going into, like, setting up a program for a college football program? Yeah, well, number one, it's awesome. And I'll, I'll tell you this. Having, you know, I think this is my 18th year coaching now in, in uh, overall, like, including my, my experience with the military, um, which I don't feel like I'm that old. But, uh, you know, I – I've been trying to prepare for the opportunity to be a head strength coach for a long time. And I think right time, right place, as you guys know, coach Wilson, I think a lot of our philosophy matches up on how to coach, how to coach a team hard, but be good people. And to, and part of that to me is creating an environment. So I may, I've, I've been able to hire individuals that I've worked with or want to develop and grow, you know, younger strength coaches. Cause at the group of five level where we're at, you don't get, you know, like a coach Eaton, a coach Shaw Williams, a coach Davis, a coach Baggett as your assistants, right? You get guys that, you know, are hungry and younger and you have to develop them. And that's been part of, I've always worked with the interns as an assistant. And so to me, like running and developing a program, I've done a lot of those same things as an assistant, but now it's just working with the head coach and, you know, kind of taking, you know, his, his vision and trying to execute that. And that's where it becomes difficult, right? Because if you don't match up as the strength coach with your head football coach, you begin to butt heads a little bit and you know luckily and i know you guys have talked on the other podcasts about you know i i think i listened to leduc's podcast when he when he was on it <laughs> and uh, just talking about the similarities right he was comfortable because some of the things were similar and you take all of the good things as a head strength coach and you, you eliminate the bad so when coach wilson and i were talking about the opportunity he's like hey i know that you know the fourth quarter program well i want you to make it the way that it should be for us with the things that i know that need to be in there 
And so we eliminated a few things that we thought, you know, were, you know, too much or things that we thought weren't appropriate to be in there. We changed a few things like the weight room is kind of, um, there's some similarities to like the structure of how we did it at Oregon. Um, but that was the same way we did it at Maryland because we ran fourth quarter, quarter program at Maryland. And I really took to that. It was very similar to how I was trained in college, although there was no like fourth quarter tag on it by my strength coach who was at Virginia Tech for almost 30 years. And there's a little bit of old school in that. There's a little bit of new school with like the, you know, the GPS and the technology and all those things. But the work on the front end, you can plan, but when you have 110 to 120 guys on the roster, you've got a very big spread of how your team responds to training, right? You've got some guys who are really explosive and they overtrain really quickly and need to have, you know, recovery in there. You have some guys that are slow or like hard gainers, like they would call it and need way more training. And you have some guys in the middle that you can, you kind of train for the 80% and the 10% on the other side, you try to have your coaches educated enough to manage that 10% either way. Right. And I think that's what the really good ones do. Um, unless you have a staff of like, you know, 10 people or, or coaches that are ready to be head strength coaches, you have to just be a, a really good manager and delegator. And, you know, I think I've just had the ability to do that over the course of the years, just because I've had a bunch of different roles um, in my time as an assistant, um, you know, and there's even more stories that we could probably get into, but I've had mm -hmm. a lot of experience as an assistant over the years that have prepared me for this. So it's been really fun to me to be able to run the program with a guy that, you know, I only knew for a year being at Oregon only for that 21 season, but you know, we hit it off really quickly and I saw how he coached you guys, Nate, and I saw how he coached his room and how, how he was respected by the team. And those things mean a lot to me because it means you're a good person too. Like you can be a hard coach, but if you have it both ways, you make great relationships and you coach guys really hard. Like those things can still go hand in hand. And, you know, everybody's going to have something to say, but I think to me, that's the biggest thing is that we spend so much time with these guys that it behooves me to have an environment where guys want to train or at least understand why we're training the way we train. So that that's, that's what matters to me. I mean, we're going to, we're going to train harder. We're going to prepare these guys to be ready to play football at the end of the day. But if we can have an impact further than that, that's, that's what I, you know, I'm ultimately here for. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think, I think I just saw a video really recently of cross Patton actually squatting over 500 pounds. <laughs> yeah. Cross crazy. Cr cross Patton is like at most maybe 180 pounds, which, which is like, like, right. And He's like so one set tip of the scales, like a big 170 <laughs> right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> So it's like it's like you, you basically you, over a course of a, a career you you're transforming these kids into almost, like superheroes. It, it's actually it's almost insane in, in a lot of ways. So I guess one one thing which I I always wish um, college football was allowed to do, but unfortunately I think there's a lot of rules and restrictions around it is to really hit into like the nutrition side of things. Um, I know we have yeah. nutritionists and, you know, they can only guide you so far, but I guess the question is uh, for you as a strength coach, like if you were, you know, no rules, NCAA and <laughs> programs are allowed full freedom to give their players whatever they want, like what type of like supplements or nutritional programs or whatnot would you like want your athletes to get on? Yeah, I mean, those, those rules have changed so significantly, even over the last 20 years, it's been ridiculous. Like. When I played, you couldn't have a bagel with cream cheese or a bagel with peanut butter because it was considered a meal and you weren't you were allowed like a certain number of meals per day. Now it's pretty much now it's pretty much all bets are off with like the feeding of the teams. It's really up to your budget. Um, and, and what it comes down to is do you have the staff, nutritionists, dietitians to be able to be around the guys as much as possible, right? Um, and I think that's number one. But number two, there are still NCAA restrictions on supplementation, right? So, I mean, the biggest things like nutrition is like 80% of the game, um, which is which is huge. And like you're saying, so that's a huge focus for us. And, you know, that was one thing for here. When we got here, we didn't have a nutritionist, we didn't have a mental health specialist. So that's a huge focus for us to be able to get that. And so luckily with with my experience and and knowing, you know, a lot of the, the power, I've been at, you know, multiple power, power five schools, I just began to reach back before we kind of got our nutrition program off the ground and, and we're working to, to hire some full-time nutritionists here. Um, but utilizing essentially all of the, the professionals that I know to run it the correct way. And it just takes time. It takes time to sit down with players, it takes time to, 
to take them on to teach them. It's all education based, right? About teaching how to eat, what to eat, when to eat, like why to eat certain things or how to expand your palate. And those things are really huge. Um, but to be, to, to be honest with you, the first thing we did was just add more food. And I think that's the biggest thing that, that folks miss is like, you know, if you can't get your team to eat, I don't care what you're eating. If you can't get them to eat, you're not going to lose or gain weight <laughs> off the bat. Like, like fat guys get stay fat because they eat a lot of food. Like skinny guys stay skinny because they don't eat a lot of food. And either way, you need to get bigger guys if they're if they're really fat to eat better food. And they can eat the same amount. They just got to eat better food, make better choices. Skinnier guys got to eat better food and more of it, right? So that's the first thing we did here. But to to kind of answer the second part of your question, I mean, really, there's extensive research on creatine. Um, I mean, it goes as far as it ranges from now like adolescents to, to the elderly, it's, it's beneficial for. And there's some really great research over the last 30 plus years that really, and if anybody's talking about like kidney issues from creatine, whatever they've not, they don't know anything about the research. And <laughs> to be, I mean, I, I promise you this, I've been on creatine probably since I thought, like, finished playing college football. Um, and my wife was a college athlete, probably better, like definitely better than I was in college and took it when she was in college. Um, when, when it comes time for my kids to go play sports, they'll probably be taking it, but there's a lot for, um, there's a lot now uh, concussion research coming out that's got neuroprotective uh, abilities where it like, helps the brain power. Um, that fish oils, multivitamins, like pretty much the same things anybody should be taking if like they need to supplement their diet, like in general, those would be great. But, um, and you see a lot in this environment too, guys with vitamin D deficiency, and so that that is a huge thing. I, and I don't know if you guys knew this at Oregon. Um, we were doing it at Maryland, but especially in some of these Pacific Northwest schools where you don't get as much sun, um, you get vitamin D deficiency. That has a really big link to mental health issues. So supplementing with vitamin D is a really big thing for, for the teams. And we get like, you know, the same amount of days of rain we got in, in Eugene. That's how many days of sun we get here in Reno. So you don't see that quite as, <laughs> quite as much. But um, but. You know, there's there's no like secret sauce. It's just, I think the education of like, maybe you've experienced it in high school, but you know, how much sleep do you need to get? How much water do you need to be drinking or just be hydrating in general? How much food should you be eating? Like those things can can take your program to the next level if you educate your team the right way and they do it far beyond, you know, any, any other like what I can do with back squats or what I can do with, you know, running or conditioning. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, I think, you know, the whole the whole world has kind of, you know, started to see this new sort of wave of really caring about longevity, you know, not just in football, but For outside sure. of football. Uh, yeah. Right. You, you see it in your biggest podcasters in the world, the Joe Rogan, you see it with presidential candidates and RFK, you see it all, all over the place. <laughs> right. right? I, I, guess, no I guess I guess if you, you know, and this is a little bit of a selfish question now that you're for retired players like Nate and myself, like what type of, uh, I guess, program or I guess not really program, but general best guidelines would you push like former athletes towards? I would say anything that interests you because, you know, you kind of get disillusioned with like having a strength coach over you, making you do stuff every single day. <laughs> but the biggest thing that happens is you, you lose, you kind of lose a little motivation. Like I'm just going to take a little break. And what I have found in being an, a former player and being in this environment, everybody's like, oh, it must be easy for you because you work in a weight room. And I'll tell you what, I, my staff and I train at five o'clock in the morning every day when I don't have to be there. I could roll in at like 6.30 and be ready for the seven o'clock group and not do that. But the nature of the job makes me busy throughout the day until I get ready to go home. And then I want to go home and like go to my kids' practices or go eat dinner with my family or hang out with my wife or whatever. So, at, once you realize that life kind of gets in your way, you just got to make a concerted after effort to be consistent. I mean, I've seen some guys that get into like really being in the gym and loving like training and that's cool. Like some guys really like the CrossFit style of training because it, they, they know the movements and it's just something that's like a little competitive and you have a locker room style environment, you find the right type of gym. That's cool too. I don't really like recommend any one specific thing. I just think you just need to stay, keep staying active. I mean, th there's so many benefits to it. And now I'm like, sound like a health coach or something like that too. But uh, I mean, personally, I've, I've, I've been fortunate to be in this environment where I've had training partners because 
usually strength coaches or meatheads and love to continue to train, right? But not every strength coach wants to get up and lift. And, every, and you know, there are plenty of strength coaches that I know that will have a, a responsibility and they'll push their training to the side or push their workouts aside because they have other responsibilities and they won't get up because they're tired because the hours are long uh, parts of the year or what have you. And that causes way bigger issues uh, I mean, we go back to it, but mental health issues and longer, longer health issues. So like, as far as longevity, like just do something consistent and, you know, whatever that motivates you, like, you know, th that I'm just fortunate right now that there's always like interns rolling through that are young and want to learn. And so I just say, Hey, we're training at five. If you want to be part of it, like you're going to learn way more lifting with us than you will, you know, in our dedicated strength session where we're talking about, here's how to coach these lifts and here, you know, we're challenging you to grow as a coach Like those things to me, you don't get as much experience as you do as like just training with other folks that, I mean, now I've been, you know, lifting or training in some capacity consistently for like the better half of when did I finish playing football? Like 2005 or something like that. So like, <laughs> you know, so, since that long. So. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's great to hear. I know me and Brad are both active dudes and I think it, yeah. I don't know. We, we still have that not itch to compete, but I think just a, it was a part of our daily lives for six years in college. So it's like, yeah it's hard to just like not train or you feel guilty. So yeah, I know you, uh, like you feel lazy if you don't, if you don't do yeah, something. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, kind and that's, that's kind of a benefit too, is like, you're going to feel better even if you don't want to do it. And you know, you have, you also had the unfortunate benefit of being a college football athlete where you're like, I have to go because otherwise I'm going to be like, you know, coming at 6 a.m. on Saturday or like coming, like doing something stupid for punishment or whatever, whatever it is. Like, you know, uh, and, and that's like kind of the reality of it. And, and it, it used to be way worse, you know, now with, I mean, NCAA regulates how we have to do it. Like I just take the guy's time. Now they have to clean the weight room if they laid or missed or whatever else. That's like <laughs> that. I think a guy would rather do like push, you know, bear call a hundred yards or whatever. than like, I'm going to ignore them, turn the music off in the weight room. They got to clean like every du piece of dust particle off the racks that they have. Like that's boring <laughs> to me. Like, first yeah. of all, you don't get, first of all, you don't get to lift with your team. Second of all, you got to clean the weight room and the interns just get to watch you and they love it because they're like drinking coffee and like, they don't have to do the, <laughs> the job. So, right. but, but in any case, like that's the benefit of being a college athlete is like, you have to do it. Now, when you don't like, you don't have to, and nobody's standing over your shoulder. Like I just say, find an environment where, you know, it's conducive to like, you want to like compete against somebody like CrossFit's done a great job of that, of just staying like keeping that environment there. So if you're looking, I mean, there's plenty of gyms now that are open that are that style where it's like a, you know, it's a competitive class where you do things for time or most right, right. You know, you know, rounds for time or whatever it is like that at least gives you something you're, you know, breathing hard, lifting some weights, feel like you're doing something and like, you just want to leave like kind of sweaty and tired. Like that, that's, I think that's good enough to me to, to be able to do for a long time. It's not like I lift some heavy weights now just because I can, and I'm, there's going to be a day where I can't. So and I need, yeah. I'll need to find another way around it. But, uh, you know, you still, I still try to get out there and like, you know, show my chops a little bit and the ability to like push some weight around and, you know, until I have the ability to not do that or I'm kind of broken or whatever it is. So. <laughs> you're, you're teeing up the next question for us already. We were going to ask, we've seen the videos. I know the, maybe the public haven't, uh, if you don't <laughs> go, go give uh, coach Baggett a follow on Instagram, but what is your max? Cause I know you're still pushing around weight. <laughs> uh, we would see you come in the weight room and just destroy you know, we'd feel about, we feel good about ourselves, you know, put up five plates, six plates. We're like, Oh, I'm strong. You know, I'm prime of my life. And then you would come in the gym and just put up like seven. So what's the max, what are you pushing around right now? And you know, just does it feel good on your body still? Cause that's a yeah. lot of weight. <laughs> How are your knees not dust at this point? It's <laughs> I tell you what, I didn't have any knee issues playing. I, I mean, I never tore anything in my knees. So like, I feel fine there. I've got like elbow and wrist and shoulder stuff. Um, so I don't do as much of the Olympic lifts anymore. Like I don't clean anymore. Um, mm. when I front squat, I have to like hold my, hold the bar across my chest. Like, you know, like the guys we tell not to, but, um, <laughs> all right. I'll just give you a couple of recent numbers. Like last night I benched 385 for two. Ooh. Um, pretty good. Not bad. Uh, <laughs> like two weeks ago, I squatted 635 for three. Like we haven't met, we don't, we don't do like a lot of one rep stuff, but we'll do, you know, I think yeah. I deadlifted like 675 recently um like it within this like summertime frame so i mean Ooh, we're still pushing on. weights and like you know <laughs> it's 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 fun um but i think the one thing that is that i've been able to do like to continue that is like one longevity like 
I, I don't always train like that, but I do something consistent, right? And so, you know, we'll train hard through the summer. Like, actually, my staff and I, we do speed school on Mondays before the team does it. So we do speed school at 5 a.m. So one, it teaches my staff how to run speed school. Two, it, it shows, like, we it's teaching, but, you know, I still enjoy doing that stuff. And I think that goes further. Like, I think that's why my body's able to recover. We do a lot. Like, we talked about CrossFit a little bit. We add in some of those, like, like the wads. Like, we're, we're doing stuff that's, you know, hard and intense. I think that has a lot of ability to recover. I'm not, you know, one of the strength coaches that just lifts heavy weights and we don't do like some of the conditioning aspects of it. So that to me has a really big ability on recovery. And so, you know, I, I don't think it's as much as like, oh, squats hurt your knees. Like they hurt your knees if you have a bad technique. But, you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, like I, I usually, if I'm like feeling bad one day or I've got like an issue, same as we try to do for you as you're going through a season or whatever, like, elbow shoulder knee hip like i try to stay away from those movements if i'm feeling really beat up from training or from like days i mean there's most days we're in the summer or the winter we're getting 20 25 000 steps and we're tra- like that's why i train before the day starts is because i don't feel like doing anything at the end of that day anyways and it's more of you know just doing things that still make your body feel okay and like yeah i'll get sore and things like that but you know it's just about like still trying to do recovery like you're telling the guys to and so mm. like foam roll and stretching, like my wife's a yoga instructor. And so I do yoga with her, you know, at least once a week. Um, and I'm not very good at it, but you know, it's, it's better than nothing and it, it helps recovery and, you know, it helps us, you know, she does it for the team as well. And like, we try to, I use that to push the guys for recovery as well. So, I mean, I don't know. It's just the, the biggest thing I can tell you is consistency with it. And that, that prevents a lot of the issues of like, you know, a guy starting back up that hasn't done it for years and then he gets hurt and he's like, well, I'm not doing that again because I got hurt. Yep. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I know, I know we touched on a little early, earlier with Cross Patton about how he's putting up insane numbers at his at his body uh, weight. I guess the, the question, you know, for, for everyone who's watching this pod, you know, they flip on a Nevada game this year. Um, I guess who are some of like the... Uh, you know, white room warriors that that Nevada has got on the on the roster this year that we should be looking for. Also, hey man, I... also like some of the biggest freaks you've ever seen in the weight room because you've been around. You've been around Power Five programs. <laughs> yeah. There's there's yeah. been some dudes not only at Oregon, but I imagine the other schools too, where there was just yeah. strong ass dudes. Uh, we want to hear a couple of those as well. I mean, every school's got them, I and I'll get back to your question, Brad. Uh, I mean. If we just want to talk about through the years, I mean, you guys saw some of the, like the guys that were biggest freaks, like Logan, Logan Sagapolo and Lois Cool yeah. and some of those guys. Like, you know, they they look at they look at a barbell and they get like ridiculously strong. I mean, like some of those guys, like Mace Funa, um, over the, over the years that were like that was just a year that I was there. And there's way more. Like KT was a guy that could touch a barbell. Walk, I mean, on this podcast here, like Walk was just a grinder, but he was like yeah. had some abilities in the weight room. Um, you know, there was there were guys there were some freaks at Maryland that like just ridiculous um, abilities and like speed wise, strength wise. It was like, we had an offensive tackle named Jalen Duncan who like could do anything he wanted to, when he wanted to, like you put a weight on the bar and he's just like, I'm going to go do this weight. And he played and he's, <laughs> you know, got an opportunity in the NFL right now. And you, and you know, also that, that like sometimes the weight room warriors aren't always the best guys on the field. But when you talk about the guys that can do it on the field and can, and can do it, I mean, we're, we got another one coming here. Adrian Jackson is going to be here on the roster yeah. here pretty soon. And like yeah. that guy doesn't even know how good he could be. I mean, I, I think he does, but like he, he'd be like, Oh, if he's doing that weight, I'm going to just like, all right, I'm going to throw, you know, one, one forties, you know, pre- like pressing one forties single arm or whatever. Like those <laughs> people don't, people don't realize that that's like an actual barbell with a plate on either side. The guy, like he's doing with like one arm. <laughs> um, so it's crazy, you know, but you know, here's what I'll say getting here and being able to be now in a second year we've got a lot of guys that are finally just realizing their abilities and you know it takes some time when you take over a program to kind of get guys unless they trained that certain way beforehand which they didn't really hear um before and that's no knock that's whatever you know whatever that staff really thought was uh, appropriate for training their team but like you know as, as you guys know we've got you know some d linemen like some 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 of our poly guys that like probably never touch weights in high school that like I had a guy go from like 385 pound back squat to like 520 just from the winter to like the end of the summer. And like, you know, 130, 50 pounds swing in, you know, in that, in that, you know, we went through spring ball, we had some time off and then we had eight weeks of the summer. That is like, that's unheard of. 
And so yeah. there's some D linemen that have like some freak abilities. We got a guy named Deion Washington who's gonna he was hurt a little bit last year and then got some playing time. We've got another one of our starters, James Hansen. Um, you know, but I mean, we've got the same thing. We've got the cross patterns, we've got guys, you know, I had a I have a there's a DB, we have a safety that I didn't let him go that far, but he benched like 385, probably could bench over four plates um, and can still jump out the gym and guys that can sprint over like 22, 23 miles an hour on the GPS. And like, you know, you, you've got all those guys that, you know, every level is just how, how you're training, right? And, and, you know, I think we have a really good comprehensive program that enhances all that stuff. And it's awesome to see big weight going, but also we want to make sure that they're still going to be really good football players or at least have the ability to play football well. I don't care, you know, I love the guys that love the weight room and I love the weight room myself, but you know, I was a guy that was a weight room guy cause I was a walk on and I needed that. But like you had Stand to transfer up. that ability, had to, had to transfer that ability over <laughs> somehow. Like, you know, we, we're, we're, our stories are not, not too different. I mean, the, the walk story, I mean, you know, those type of things where you, you know, you play long enough and try to earn a scholarship and get some playing time. Like that was my story. So that's, I love those guys in the weight room, but also I know the reality of my job is like, I better make sure that the guys that, have those abilities in the weight room can still play ball the right way. And, yeah. you know, I think sometimes strength coaches love to coach the guys who are weight room guys because they're easy to coach. And I, I really want to get the guys who aren't weight room guys to at least understand so that they can like begin to be weight room guys a little bit, or if they understand why we have something that that they're training on, I think they can, they're going to pour more into it and be better at it, even if they don't love what we're doing. And that's really hard, right? Because some guys just come like, Hey, I'm here to play ball. And, you know, I think it's way more beneficial to be able to train those guys to, you know, to one, play football really well, but two, be, you know, enhance explosiveness, enhance their strength, enhance the, you know, all those qualities that make them better and able to, to play longer. So, you know, I, I think I kind of have a good balance in my mind, at least of, the, of both those things. But everybody loves the, the freak stories because there's, I mean, and every place has got them. It doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't yeah. matter where you're at. Oh, yeah. You get some, I mean, Oregon, I'm trying to think. I think, I don't know if you were there for when he was there, but I think to me, there's this guy named Shane Lemieux, who is like the the, the most insane guy in the weight room that, that at least I saw when, when I was yeah. there. Da Dallas squatted like 700, I think. Right. No, I knew um, all those guys because I knew Coach File really well because Coach File hmm. and I worked oh, yeah, together yeah. At, at Maryland. So all those names are, and I, and I met those guys too that came back uh, when they came back at Eugene or whatever else. Right. So. Met Shane, met Dallas, knew of those guys. I'd seen it, you know, them, them chopping it up with some of the other coaches over the course of time too. So, some dogs, yeah. some dogs. Absolutely. So I think be before we get into power rankings and trivia to end it, kind of want to go with the uh, preview of the season coming up. Not the best year for the pack last year, but up and up. You know, first year in the new regime, always going to be rough. How are we feeling about this year? Most excited games on the schedule. I know you guys got some power five opponents coming up. What are you most excited for for this season? Well, to be honest with you, I'm look. I'm just hoping for us to, to increase our win count. And, you know, I think we have a lot of guys that, that are, want to do it the right way um, and continue on to, like, kind of play the Nevada way, which is, you know, one really cool with having Coach Wilson back here and just the, the tradition and culture that he understands having coached here for almost 20 years, 23. He was here for 23 years and, and uh, 19 years as a coach. So that is one thing that, that I think we have done a really good job of, of playing a certain way when you come here or when we come to you, like, we're going to – you know, we're not going to be a team that, that gives up or doesn't, doesn't finish games. Right. And so, yep. you know, yeah, obviously we've got some big, big names on the schedule. You guys know we're, we're going down to USC, um, which you guys are really familiar with from the PAC 12. So that'll yep. be a really in interesting game for us. Um, and I, and I think, you know, we have Kansas here at home. What a great year last year. And I think we have a really good slate of mountain West games for us home and away. Um, you know, we owe, we owe a lot of guys back. And I think you guys talked about it on another podcast, but um you know, Colorado State has become a rivalry because of some of the, uh, you know, some of the back and forth between coaching staffs and back and forth between guys transferring there and everything else. And although we're not looking ahead to any game, you know, I think that there's teams that we feel like or the guys feel a certain way that they, they owe, owe a team. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of emotional, you know, games coming up this year because we've got guys that um, I really felt like every every week last season – we were in a lot of the games where we didn't come out on top and we had mistakes that hurt us. We had positions that maybe we didn't have, you know, all the way full, but we had some really great performers and we had some really great guys on the roster last year. And we had some young guys that have now developed and we've, you know, I think continuing with recruiting and the transfer portal has continued to boost our, our, you know, our ability with our roster. And so, you know, I'm, I'm excited right now because I've seen how these guys have been working since January and, 
you know, that's not everything. Obviously, the weight room doesn't determine wins and losses, but, you know, you could put yourself in a good position, I think, to win the mental game. And I think that's what we've done is just give ourselves an edge to be really successful. And, you know, whatever that looks like, I know, guy, you know, every team wants to win their conference or wants to go to a bowl game. And, you know, you have those aspirations. And what we talk about a lot is like success of, of habit and success of never being too high, too low. So I think that for us will carry us a lot further. You know, obviously I want to go to bowl game that, that benefits everybody in the program and it brings better recruits and it being, brings people in the program to, to give money. And like, you look at it from this side, the coaching side, there's a lot more benefits to it than just like, Oh, we had to get to go play an extra game or, you know, get to go experience a bowl game. Like, you know, I get to stay here another year with my family and not, not worry about losing my job or whatever else. So, you know, but, Here's what I will say. We can't be a lot worse. So, I mean, let's, <laughs> let's freaking go like go pack. Let's get after this thing. I mean, for sure, for sure. We're, we're going to turn this thing around and it's going to be exciting to watch the pack play this year. hundred percent. Well, I think now we're going to kind of start to close, close this thing out. I think we want to get into power rankings here. Nate, do you want to introduce that? Yeah. So we'll, you'll give your top three of whatever category we choose. We'll let you go first. Guess always goes first. You list your top three. And then we'll follow up. And then whatever you say, we can't uh, repeat. So kind of a fun game we play. Just, you know, loosen the guests up, have a little fun at the end of the interview. So okay. the the category today is of lifts, like lifting right, exercises. Works. So All your right. top three, it can be anything from bicep curls to, you know, hamstrings to leg extensions, anything, any lift you can pick. And your okay. top three. So we'll give you All a little... Right. Well, third, I know you're ready to go, but you know, give you you know a little time to think, and maybe then I'll you give, can kick maybe us I'll off. give you guys time time to think. And yeah, yeah you probably have a of, list of thirty just in, popped in your in, head. In spite in spite of some of your former strength coaches, I don't think you're gonna find bicep curls on my list whatsoever. <laughs> but uh, it is it is time for fill the sleeves right now, though. So, it is day one um, today. Shout out, out, shout out, fill the sleeves. <laughs> well, number one for me is gonna be back squat, and that's personal. Uh, and, and with the team, but that's that's just more just going to be because that's one of my most favorite ones. Um, <laughs> number two, uh, low key the snatch, which is not what what most people like really enjoy, but that's one of my only and more favorite Olympic lifts that one I can perform. I don't usually do it with my teams, but personally, just enjoy doing it because I mean it's pretty technical, but um, it's something that you know is uh, is more fun. And then I probably just go. Um, Probably with I, I don't know if it's an, it counts as an exercise, but I'm going to go um, a wad of the day workout of the day because I love to do stuff that's like competitive or timed or whatever and like to compete with our staff or whatever else. So so that that's kind of more all encompassing. But we almost always finish with something that's like a challenge where like you're doing something for time or you're doing rounds for time or you're competing for most reps or whatever. So rather than like a specific exercise, that I mean, if I had a, like top three those things for me would always be in a program that I was doing. Those, those, nice. those are good, good ones. That, uh, this isn't part of my list, but I remember one time, uh, when we were at Oregon, the final like part of a workout, they, you guys just made us hold a 45 pound plate <laughs> above our head. <laughs> and I hated that. And it, they just said like, all right, last one, last one. Yeah. You're still holding it above their head wins. I think the worst though was when we did the circuit with the plate where we did the movements where it was either like clockwise, yeah. counterclockwise, oh, over the head brutal. pushes. Right. Uh, the, I think that was worse than just the holds because that was tough. I'll tell you what, that has like roots, like that has almost like traumatizing memories to me, like watching you guys do that because <laughs> I remember, I remember going to like a wrestling camp in high school and like that was like you'd have like four sessions a day of either training or like wrestling or running or whatever. And that was like, anytime you went to the, like the weightlifting session, it was that it was like, hold a plate over your head or do the plate circuit. And I'm just like, like screw this. I don't want to do I feel like I'm, wa I'm watching the team and like, you know, there's not a whole lot of time where the strength coach feels sorry for the team, but like, that's one of the times where I'm just like, I effing hate this. Like, this is like one of my most like dreaded memories of like the, of a movement of how to do like a circuit wise or whatever and that's the finisher that's after two hours of that's after like two hours of hard training <laughs> right um, brad do you yeah. want to go or i'll go uh yeah you go so number one shout out coach Fod, i gotta go with the bicep curl just you know <laughs> curls for the girls just an awesome lift it's just 
fully ego lift because I'm not bicep curling a tackle when I make a tackle in football. I'm not bicep curling. That's has nothing to do with it. But strictly ego lift. But once you get the pump and you see the van, it's just a, a feeling like <laughs> no other. Um, and then I'm gonna go with what I kind of liked when we did on the platform work was the push jerk. Um, I thought it was very like just you know you could do a lot with it. We had very different forms of the push jerk. You could do you know split jerk, and it didn't like the power clean where it just tanked your body after you got done power cleaning like you were done like that was it for workout you were your body was cake but uh yeah i really enjoyed the push jerk so i wouldn't go with bicep curls push jerk i gotta throw some legs in there right like that's just a classic calf raise because <laughs> you know well, like calves are true, genetic true. True death yes. jockey, you know. Yes, Just... yes, exactly. <laughs> you you can tell I transitioned into the uh, post oh, post playing full-time. career phase. Absolutely. Uh, you, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, you want to get the big calves. Shout out Johnny Drama and Entourage, bro. Are those natural? <laughs> are those natural, bro. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, those are mine. Go ahead, Brad. All right, I don't know how this fell this far down, but obviously, I think you got to throw in a bench press. Um, Love it. I yep. think uh, I. I argue that that's almost an ego lift for certain positions too uh 100%. yeah maybe especially quarterback i want to say um <laughs> but um next i'm gonna go muscle up because it's just that nice. much cooler than a pull up so it much cooler. it's so much cooler <laughs> <laughs> and last one i'm just gonna have to throw in the one that i hated the most of all time which is the sled push <laughs> yes that, that's the worst Just so heavy underrated though that's a that's a great movement i mean mm-hmm. it, it made your top three even though you hated it that much but it, it is an underrated move very functional you're always trying to push in one yeah. for the game of yeah. football i and not only muscle up but i think very underrated pull up because it just hits the whole upper body i mean i still oh, yeah. do pull-ups to this day just because i saw you know i saw the improvement i i saw with my not only my strength but just you know, being functional. Like I think pull-ups are so big. So yeah, shout out to pull up. A great one. But yeah, let's right uh, wrap it up with trivia. I got two questions. I know Brad will probably not get these. So really for our guest here, uh, coach Baggett, <laughs> who invented the back squat and who invented the bench press? I'm going to need the name. <laughs> that, that's a great question. I don't think I have an answer for you. It's the same, it's the same guy, right? It is not. Did, did you research this? Oh. Google as much as you can. All right, well, give it to me because I'm not. I, I'm not going to be able to give you any cl- any close uh, idea of an answer. So we use, you know, shout out the NFL, my employer. We use the bench press still in the combine today. Right. So shout out to George Hackenschmid. The creation <laughs> of the bench press can be traced back to George Hackenschmid in 1891. He was a Baltic German who was known for being a strongman of Russia. He became well known after performing many heavy lifts beginning in 1896. And one of his key lists was just pushing stuff off of his chest, laying down. So yeah, shout out to he, George. He, he is also he is also the cultivator of the hack squat, which is shortened by his last name. So I wouldn't yes. know to give you that name, but there's a there's a movement called the hack squat that was named after him as well. Yes, and then who invented the modern back squat? Your favorite lift? I'm not going to be able to answer that one either. Henry Steinborn. He oh, arrived in one. America just after World War One and is recognized as the inventor of the modern squat. So shout out Henry. Which is which is interesting that I know all these names because there's a, there's a name lift na- uh, lift name after the Steinborn. It's called the Steinborn lift as well. And I know all these names, but that's not ever been part of anything that I really needed to know for the job. So <laughs> I pre- I appreciate you educating me on that. There we go. But uh, yeah, that's cool. Right. On. But yeah, those were my trivia questions. Shout out Ryan because it. it's a hard job. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Thanks for that great trivia, Nate. Glad we got no a, a good, good shot there. Um, well, anyway, I guess last thing before you go is just how much are you loving Tahoe? It's been awesome, there. man. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. My family was, my family was out of town this weekend, uh, still, and I went, I went on a hike, and like you can go on a bunch of these hikes right, right around here, and like look down at Lake Tahoe. My house is like. 40 minutes from Tahoe, but like 20 minutes of that drive is up the front of the mountain. The other 20 minutes is down the backside where you're looking right at Tahoe. And, oh, and we, awesome. we, we skied all fall and into the winter. Um, I think our last ski day was like the last weekend of April. So like 
I mean, and the top, the top lift of the mountain that we go to is right overlooking Tahoe. It's like 25 minutes from the house. Like that, it's pretty awesome, man. They're just this area, Reno, I mean, especially being from the East coast, uh, sometimes I'm like, look at my wife and I'm like, who lives in Reno? Like, what is, what is Reno, Nevada <laughs> anyway? It's like, but it's really cool. Like it's a really unique place because you have, you know, so many unique destinations right around this area with Lake Tahoe and everything else that like, it's Absolutely. pretty, I mean, it is a gem, like, like being able to go to Lake Tahoe and be able to have that right in your backyard is pretty awesome. Yeah. It's, it's super nice. I mean, I, I've been guessing your, uh, your kids probably will want to do like a hundred summer camps in, around Lake Tahoe and everything like that oh, too. They'd yeah. Be there, be there in the water every day <laughs> if they could. Right. <laughs> anyway, we, uh, we really appreciate you coach for coming on and, yep. uh, best of luck to you and the Nevada Wolfpack on this upcoming season. Appreciate you guys. Awesome to see you. Yeah, great right to on. see you, man. Thanks, guys.